Danger Signals, Chapters 3, 4, and 5 by John A. Hill and Jasper E. Brady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 3 in a wreck. The change from Alfreda to the chief dispatcher's office in Nicholson was indeed a pleasant one. The dispatchers, especially the first trick man, seemed somewhat dubious as to my ability to do the work, but I was rapidly improving in telegraphy, and in spite of my extreme youth, I was allowed to remain. But the life of a railroad man is very uncertain and one day we were much surprised to hear that the road had gone into the hands of receivers. There were charges of mismanagement made against a number of the higher officials on the road, and one of the first things the receivers did was to have a general house-cleaning. The general manager, the general superintendent, and a number of the division superintendents resigned to save dismissal, and my friend, the chief dispatcher, went with him. He was succeeded by Ted Donahue, the man who had been working the first trick, Ted didn't like me worth a cent, and rather than give him an opportunity to dismiss me, I quit. I was at home idle for a few weeks, and then hearing that there might be an opening for operators on the CQ and R, a new road building up in Nebraska, I once more started out. It was an all-night ride to the division headquarters, and thinking I might as well be luxurious for once, I took a sleeper. My berth was in the front end of the last car on the train. I retired about half-past ten, and soon dropped off into a sound sleep. I had been asleep for perhaps two hours, when I was awakened by the car giving a violent lurch, and then suddenly stopping. I was stunned and dazed for a moment, but I soon heard the cracking and breaking of timbers, and the hissing of steam painfully near to my section. I tried to move and rise up, but found that the confines of my narrow quarters would not permit it. I then realized that we were wrecked, and that I was in a bad predicament. I had felt that I had no bones broken, and my only fear was that the wreck would take fire. My fears were not groundless, for I soon smelled smoke. I cried out as loudly as I could, but my berth had evidently become a soundproof booth. Then I felt that my time had come, and had about given up all hope, and was trying to say a prayer, when I heard the train crew and passengers working above me. Again I cried out, and this time was heard, and soon was taken out. God, what a night it was, raining a perfect deluge, and the wind blowing a hurricane. I learned that our train had stopped on account of a hot driving box on the engine. The hind brakeman had been sent back to put out a flag, but imagining there was nothing coming, he had neglected to do his full duty, and before he knew it a fast freight came tearing round the bend, and a tail and collision was the result. Seeing the awful effects of his gross neglect, the brakeman took out across the country, and was never heard of again. I fancy if he could have been found that night by the passengers and train crew, his lot would have been anything but pleasant. Two people in the sleeper were killed outright, and three were injured, while the engineer and fireman of the freight were badly hurt by jumping. I didn't get a scratch. As I stood watching the wrecked cars burn, I heard the conductor say he wished to God he had an operator with him. I told him I was an operator and offered my services. He said there was a pocket instrument in the baggage car, and asked me if I would cut in on the wire and tell the dispatcher of the wreck. I assented, and I went forward with him to the baggage car, where he gave me a pair of pliers, a pocket instrument, and about eight feet of office wire. I asked for a pair of climbers and some more office wire, but neither was to be had. Here, therefore, was a pretty knotty problem. The telegraph poles were thirty feet high. How was I to make a connection with only eight feet of wire and no climbers? I thought for a while, and then I put the instrument in my pocket, and undertook to shin up the pole, 
as I used to do when I was a schoolboy. After many efforts, in which I succeeded in tearing nearly all the clothes off me, I finally reached the lowest cross arm and seated myself on it with my legs wrapped around the pole. There was only one wire on this arm, so I had, comparatively speaking, plenty of room. On each of the other two cross arms there were four wires, and there was also one strung along the tops of the poles. This made ten wires in all, and I had not the least idea which one was the dispatcher's wire. The pole, being wet from the rain, made the wires mighty hot to handle. I had the fireman hand me up a piece of old iron wire he happened to have on the engine, and with this I made a flying cut in the third wire of the second cross arm. I attached a little pocket instrument, and found that upon adjusting it I was on a commercial wire. There I was, straddling a cross arm between heaven and earth, with the instruments held on my knee, and totally ignorant of any of the calls on the wire I was on. I yelled down to the conductor and asked him if he knew any of the calls. No, of course he didn't, and he was so excited he didn't have sense enough to look on his time card where the calls are always printed. Finally, after carefully adjusting the instrument, I opened my key, broke in on somebody, and said, Wreck. The answer came, Sign. I said, I haven't any sign. Number two on the KCNO has been wrecked out here, and I want the dispatcher's office. Can you tell me if he is on this wire? Now there is a vast deal of difference between sending with a bundle key on a polished table and sending with a pocket instrument held on your knee, especially when you're perched on a thirty-foot pole with the rain pouring down in torrents, the wind blowing almost a gale, and expecting every minute to be blown off and have your precious neck broken. Consequently, my sending was pretty rocky, and someone came back at me. Oh, get out, you big ham. But I hung to it and finally made them understand who I was and what I wanted. The main office in Uri cut me in on the dispatcher's wire, and I told him of the wreck. He said he had suspected that number two was in trouble, but he had no idea that it was as bad as I had reported. He said he would order out the wrecking outfit and would send doctors with it. Would I please stay close and do the telegraphing for them? He would see that I was properly rewarded. Then I told him about where I was, but promised to hold on as long as I could, but for him to be sure and set out some more wire and a pair of climbers on the wrecker. After waiting about an hour, the wrecker arrived, and with it the doctors. So our anxiety was relieved, the wounded taken care of, and a decent wrecking office put in. The division superintendent came out with them, and for my services he offered me the day office at X, which I accepted. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 A Woman Operator Who Saved a Train X was a pretty good sort of an office to have, barring a beastly climate wherein all four seasons would sometimes be able and fully represented in one twenty-four hours. But eighty big round American dollars a month was not to be sneezed at. That was a heap of money to a young chap, and I hung on. In those days civilians had not advanced as far westward as it is today, and there was not much local business on the road, due to the sparsely settled country. The first office east of X was Dunraven, some twenty miles away. Between the two places were several blind sidings used as passing tracks. Dunraven was a cracking good little village, and the day operator there was Miss Mary Marsh. There was no night office. Now I was just at the age where all a young man's susceptibilities come to the surface, and I was a pretty fair sample. I weighed one hundred and fifty pounds, and every ounce of me was as susceptible as a barometer on a stormy day. Consequently, it was not long until I knew Mary and liked her immensely. All my spare time was occupied in talking to her over the wire, except when the cussed dispatcher would chase me off with, Oh, get out, you big spoon. You make everyone tired. Then Mary would give me the Mary. Ha, ha, ha. One time I took a day off and ran down to Dunraven, and my impressions were fully confirmed. 
Mary was a little bit of a woman with black hair, red lips, white teeth, and two eyes that looked like coals of fire, so bright were they. She was small, but when she took hold of the key she was jerked lightning, and I have never seen but one woman since who was her equal in that line. Our road was one of the direct connections of the Overland Route, west to San Francisco, and twice a day we had a train that in those days was called a flyer. Now it would be in a class with the first-class freights. The westbound train passed my station at eight in the morning, and the eastbound at seven-thirty in the evening. After that I gave D.S. good night, and was free until seven the next morning. The eastbound flyer passed through Dunraven at eight-fifteen in the evening, and then Mary was through for the night. The town was a mile away from the depot, and the poor girl had to trudge all that distance alone. But she was as plucky as they make them, and was never molested. A mile west of Dunraven was Peach Creek, spanned by a wooden pile and a stringer bridge. Ordinarily you could step across Peach Creek, but sometimes after a heavy rain it would be a raging torrent of dirty, muddy water, and it seemed as if the underpinning must surely be washed out by the flood. One day, after I had been at X a couple of months, we had a stem-winder of a storm. The rain came down in torrents unceasingly for twelve hours, and the country around X was almost a morass. The roadbed was good, however, and when the section men came in at six that night, they reported the track firm and safe. But, my stars, how the rain was falling at seven-thirty as the flyer went smashing by. I made my O.S. report, and then thought I'd sit around and wait until it had passed on Raven and have a little chat with Mary before going home for the night. At 7.45 I called her, but no answer. Then I waited, 8 o'clock, 8.15, 8.20, and still nothing from Dunraven. The dispatcher then started to call D.U., but no answer. Finally he said to me, You call D.U. Maybe the wire's heavy and she can't adjust for me. I called steadily for five minutes, but still no reply. I was beginning to get scared. All sorts of ideas came into my head. Robbers, tramps, fire, and murder. D.S. said, I'm afraid something has happened to the flyer. Turn your red light on when number 26 comes along. I'll give them an order to cut loose with the engine and go through and find the flyer. Five minutes later, the wire opened and closed. Then the current became weak, but adjusting down, I heard D.S. D.S. W.K. Aha! That meant a wreck. D.S. answered, and I heard the following message. W.D.C. Peach Creek, 4.13.18. D.S. Peach Creek Bridge washed out tonight, but I heard of it, and arrived here in time to flag the flyer. Send an operator on the wrecking outfit to relieve me. Signed, Mary Marsh, Operator. Two hours afterwards, the wrecker came by X, and, obedient to orders from the dispatcher, I boarded it and went down to work the office. We reached there in about forty minutes, and found that the torrent had washed out the underpinnings of the bridge, and nothing was left but a few ties, the rails, and the stringers. The half-witted boy who lived in Dunraven had been fishing that day like Simple Simon, and came tramping up to the office, telling Mary Marsh in an idiotic way that Peach Creek Bridge had washed out. Just then she heard me O.S. the flyer, and her office was next one to mine. As the flyer did not stop at Dunraven, the baggage man and helper went home at six o'clock, and she was absolutely alone, save for this half-witted boy. The section house was a mile and a half away to the east. A mile away to the south were the twinkling lights of the village, while but one short mile to the west was Peach Creek, with the bridge gone out, and the flyer thundering along toward it with his precious load of human freight. How could it be warned? The boy hadn't sense enough to pound sand. She must do it. So quick as a flash, she picked up the red light standing near and started down the track. The rain was coming down in a perfect deluge, and the wind was sweeping across the Nebraska prairies like a hurricane. Lightning was flashing, casting a lurid glare over the soaked earth, and the thunder rolled peal after peal, resembling the artillery of great guns in a big battle. Truly it was like the setting for a grand drama. 
undaunted by all this, the brave little woman, bareheaded, hair flying in the wind, and soaked to the skin, battled with the elements as she fought her way down the track. A mile, ordinarily, is a short distance, but now, to her, it seemed almost interminable, and all the time the flyer was coming nearer and nearer to the creek with the broken bridge. My God, would she make it? Presently, above the howling of the wind, she heard the mad waters as they went boiling and tumbling down the channel. At last she was there, standing on the brink, but the train was not yet saved. Just across the creek the road made an abrupt curve round a small hill, and if she could not reach that curve her labors would be to no avail, and a frightful wreck would follow. All the bridge was gone save the rails, stringers, and a few shaky ties. Only forty feet intervened between her and the opposite bank, and get across she must. There was only one way, so, grasping the lantern between her teeth, she started across on her hands and knees. The stringer swayed back and forth in the wind, and her frail body, it seemed, would surely be caught up and blown away into the mad maelstrom of waters below. No, no, she could not fail now. Away up the road, borne to her anxious ears by the howling wind, she heard two long and two short blasts of the flyer's whistle, as she signaled for crossing. God, would she ever get there! Straining every nerve, at last success was hers, and tottering, she struggled up the other side. Flying up the track, looking for all the world like some eerie witch, she reached the curve, swinging her red light like mad. Bob Burns, who was pulling the flyer that night, saw the signal, and immediately applied the emergency brakes. Then he looked again, and the red light was gone. But caution is a magic watchword with all railroad men, and he stopped. Climbing down out of the cab to the engine, he took his torch and started out to investigate. He didn't have to go far when he came upon the limp, inanimate form of Mary Marsh, the extinguished red light tightly clasped in her cold little hand. "'My God, Mike,' he yelled to his fireman, "'it's a woman. Well, hang me if it isn't the little lady from Dunraven. wonder what she is doing out here.' He wasn't long in ignorance, because a brakeman sent out ahead saw that the bridge had gone. Roughly but kindly hands bore her tenderly into the sleeper, and under the ministrations of her own sex, she soon came round. So soon as she had seen the flyer stopping, she realized that she had succeeded, and womanlike, she fainted. Her clothes were torn to tatters, and taken all in all, this little heroine was a most woe-begone specimen of humanity. A wrecking office was cut in by the baggage man, who happened to be an old lineman and she sent the message to D.S., telling him the wreck. I relieved her, and she stayed in the sleeper all night, and the next day she returned to her work at Dunraven, but little worse for the experience. She had positively refused to accept a thing from the thankful passengers, saying she did but her duty. Two months afterward she married the chief dispatcher, and the profession lost the best woman operator in the business. I was dreadfully cut by the ending of affairs, but she had said this, Red-headed operators were not in her class, and I reckon she was about right. Surely she was a direct descendant from the Spartan mothers. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 A Night Office in Texas, A Stuttering Dispatcher It was not long after Mary threw me over that I became tired of X and gave up my job and started south. I said it was on account of ill health, but the last thing that cussed first trick dispatcher said to me was, Never mind, you old spoon, you'll get over this attack in a very short while. I landed in St. Louis one bright morning and went up to the office of the chief dispatcher of the Q.M.&.S. and applied for an office on his division. He had none to give me, but wired the chief dispatcher at Big Rock, and in answer thereto, I was sent the next morning to Healyville, and what a place I found. The town was down in the swamps of southeast Missouri, four miles north of the Arkansas line, and consisted of the depot and twenty or twenty-five houses, five of which were saloons. There was a branch road running from here to Honiton, 
quite a settlement on the Mississippi River, and that was the only possible excuse for an officer at this point. The atmosphere was so full of malaria that you could almost cut it with an axe. I stayed there just three days, and then, fortunately, the chief dispatcher ordered me to come to his office. He wanted me to take the office at Bowling Cross, near the Texas line. But I had the traveling fever and wanted to go further south, and he sent me down on the I.G.N.N., and the chief there sent me to Heron, Texas. There wasn't much sickness in the air around Heron, but there were just a million fleas to every square inch of sand in the place. Heron was one of the few towns in a very extensive cattle belt, and a few days after I had arrived, I noticed the town had filled up with cowpunchers. They just had their semi-annual roundup and were in town spending their money, and having a whooping big time. You probably know what that means to a cowboy. I was a tenderfoot of the worst kind, and everyone at the boarding house and depot seems to take particular delight in telling me of the shooting scrapes and rackets of these cowboys, and how they delighted in making a warm for a tenderfoot. Bob Wolf, the day man at the depot, told me how at times they had come up and raised particular cane at the station, especially when there was a new operator on hand. I didn't half believe all their stories, but I will confess that I had a few misgivings the first night when I went to work. One night passed safely enough, but the second was a hummer from the word go. The office was somewhat larger than the telegraph offices usually are in small towns. The table was in the recess of a big bay window, giving me a clear view of the IGNN tracks, while along the front ran the usual long, wide platform. The P, T, and C road crossed at right angles at one end of the platform, and one operator did the work for the two roads. There were two lamps over my desk, one on each side of the bay window, and one was out in the waiting rooms. I also kept a lantern lighted to carry when I went out to the trains. All through the early part of the night I heard sounds of revelry and carousing, accompanied by an occasional pistol shot up in the town. But about half-past eleven these sounds ceased, and I was congratulating myself that my night would, after all, be uneventful. About twelve o'clock, however, there arose just outside the office the greatest commotion I had ever heard in my life. I was eating my midnight lunch and had a piece of pie in my hand when I heard the tramp of many feet on the platform. It sounded like a regiment of infantry, and in a minute there came the report of a shot, and with a crash out went one of my lights, a shower of glass falling on the table. Before I could collect myself there came another shot, and smash out went the other light. I dropped my pie and spasmodically grabbed the table. The only lights left were the one in the waiting room and my lantern, which made it in the office little better than total darkness. All the time the tramp, tramp on the platform was coming closer and closer, and my heart was gradually forcing its way up in my mouth. In a moment the waiting room door was thrown open, and with a wild whoop and a big hurrah the crowd came in. The door between the office and the waiting room was closed, but that made no difference to my visitors. They smashed it open and swarmed into the office. One of them picked up the lantern, and swaggering over to where I sat all trembling with fear, and expecting that my lights would go out next, raised it to my face. They all crowded round me, and one of them gave me a good punch in the ribs. Then the one with the lantern said, Well, fellows, the little cuss is game. He didn't get under the table like the last one did. Kid, for a tenderfoot, you're a hummer. Get under the table? I couldn't. I would have given half my interest in the hereafter have been able to crawl under the table, or have to run away. But fright held its sway, and locomotion was impossible. For about five minutes the dispatcher had been calling me for orders, and in a trembling voice I asked them to let me answer and take the order. Sir, said one of them, who appeared to be the leader, go and take the order, and then take a drink with us. By the dim light of the only lantern, with my order pad on the table covered with broken glass and smattered with pie, I finally copied the order. But it was about the worst attempt I had ever made, and the conductor remarked when he signed it 
that it would take a Philadelphia lawyer to read it. The cowpunchers, however, from that time on, were very good friends of mine, and many a pleasant Sunday did I spend on their ranches. They afterwards told me that Bob Wolfe had put them up to their midnight visit in order to frighten me. They certainly succeeded. My service at Heron was not very profitable, the road being in the hands of receivers, and for four months none of us received a cent of wages. The road was called the International and Great Northern, but we facetiously dubbed it the Independent and got nothing. Some months after this I was transferred down to the Southern Division and made night operator at Mankato. This was really about the best position I had yet struck. Good hours, plenty of work, and a fine office to do it in, and eighty dollars a month. The agent and the day man were both fine fellows, and there was no chore work around the station. A baggage smasher did that. The dispatchers up in the DS office were pleasant to work with, and as competent a lot of men as ever touched a key. I never met any of them when I first took office, though of course I soon knew their names, and the following incident will disclose how, and under what unusual circumstances, I formed the acquaintance of one of them. Fred D. Armand, the second trick man. About four weeks after I took the Mankato office, engine 333, pulling a through livestock freight north, broke a parallel rod, and beside cutting the engineer into mincemeat, caused a great wreck. This took place about two miles and a half north of Mankato. The hind man came back and reported it, and being off duty, I caught up a pocket instrument and some wire, and jumping on a velocipede, was soon at the wreck. I cut in an office in short order, and Diaz soon knew exactly how matters stood. One passenger train south was tied up just beyond the wreck, and in about an hour and a half the wrecker appeared in charge of the trainmaster. I observed a young man, twenty-eight or thirty years of age, standing around looking on, and once when I was near him I noticed that he stammered very badly. I carefully avoided saying anything to that young man, because I too at times had a rather bad impediment in my speech. It asserted itself especially when I heard anyone else stutter, or when the weather was going to change. The men who knew me well said they could always foretell a storm by my inability to talk. From my own experience, however, I knew that when a stammerer heard another man stammer, he imagined that he was being made fun of, and all the fight in him came at once to the surface. And as this young man was about twice my size, I did my best to keep away from him. But in a few moments he came over to where I was and said to me, I Ask D.S. To, to, to send out my train raincoat on the, uh, on the 13th. Every other word was followed by a whistle. My great help in stammering was to kick with my right foot. I knew what was coming and tried my best to avert the trouble. I drew in a long breath and said, Who shall I say you, you are? And my right foot was doing a great execution. True to its barometrical functions, my throat was predicting a storm. It came. He looked at me for a second, grew red in the face, then catching me by the collar, gave me a yank that made me see forty stars, and said, B -b -b Blast you, what, what do, you, do you mean by mocking me? I'll smash you and be bl blamed head. Speech left me entirely then, and I'm afraid I would have been most beautifully thumped had not Sanders the trainmaster come over and stopped him. He called him the Armand, and then I knew he was the second trick dispatcher. After many efforts, the Armand told Sanders how I had mocked him. Sanders didn't know me, and the war clouds began to gather again. But Johnson, the conductor of the wrecker, came over and said, Hold on there, dear man. That kid ain't mocking you. He stammers so bad at times that he kicks a hole in the floor. Why, well, I've seen him start to say something to my engineer pulling out a Mankato, and he'd finish it just as the caboose went by, and we had some forty cars in the train at that. At this, a smile broke over dear man's face, and he grasped my hand and said, Excuse, excuse, excuse me, kid, but, but you know how it is. It is yourself. You may well believe that I did know. One night shortly after this, I was repeating an order to the Armand, and in the middle of it I broke myself very badly. He opened his key and said, Kick, you devil, kick. 
and I got the merry ha-ha from up and down the line. But in giving me a message a little while after, he flew the track, and I instantly opened up and said, Whistle, you tarrier, whistle. Maybe he didn't get it back. The End of Danger Signals Chapters 3, 4, and 5